Well, good afternoon, guys. It is a nice spring afternoon on my back porch and uh, hanging out reading some of your essays today and thinking about our work with youth ministry. So I wanted to, uh, wanted to give you a quick, quick update. Um, in week two, we were discussing uh, Greg Spears' work predicated on this notion of uh, student ministry, um, seeking uh, evangelism, encouraging students to be evangelists, and uh, you guys were asking your discussion question uh, to, to summarize why students should evangelize, where they should evangelize, and then how they should evangelize. And one of the comments that I made consistently in your in your post is that this how question um, seems to me to be at the core of the challenge um, regarding Steer's view, though I'm not I'm um, necessarily assuming that his view is wrong, uh, but but I do see uh, as a challenge re really two aspects. If we're um, centrally encouraging students to go and be evangelist, one is um, their age, and and by their age I don't mean merely the fact that some of these are 13 or 14 year olds, but the fact that they are relatively um, immature in all aspects of life, and so for many of us. Um, we would say that our awareness of the gospel, our understanding of it, and our conformity to it personally uh, was very much a process. So while God may have saved us at 12, 13, 14, uh, the work that he was doing and continuing to transform us um, really hit perhaps a high water mark, or there was, there was a point where we didn't vacillate between um, overt rebellion uh, in the same way and not uh, that happened a bit later. And so one, in sen sending out young students who are uh, continuing to grow in their understanding of faith, their understanding of the gospel and the implications of that for transforming their life, is we have the very real danger of hypocrisy uh, in their lives. And so they go and share, they are still battling, still looming certain even uh, of the truth of the gospel, and they're sent out to share which can often undermine the very message that they're trying to communicate, which is that God can transform our heart by the power of Christ uh, within us. Now, I, I do think that's true for all of us. So regardless of our age, we're still battling uh, hypocrisy and seeking to communicate uh, the work of the gospel that's still in very real ways transforming us. So I don't think that's an insurmountable obstacle. The second one I think is probably uh, more central to the danger, and it is, it is the reality um, that oftentimes students, and even adults, this certainly doesn't go away as we reach adulthood, don't know the gospel that we're attempting to communicate. So when we're asking how, like what they are to say in communicating the gospel, um, certainly uh, we're wanting them to do this in love, we're wanting to do this passionately, um, we're wanting them to speak of Jesus and the cross and eternal life. But I think the question behind the question there is, do they know what they are speaking of? Like, it's one thing to send students out um, with the message that God loves us, or the message that Jesus died so that we can go to heaven. And those are true claims in as far as they go, but they certainly don't go far enough. The, the fact that God loves us is true. But we would be remiss to say that summarizes the totality of the gospel. There's, there's so much more regarding man's sinfulness, our need for Christ, Christ's atoning work, the death, burial, resurrection. Um, all of these aspects of what makes the gospel the gospel really centralized, uh, in my mind, in Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, where we see human need and Jesus' work and uh, the transforming power of the gospel on display there. Now, is there a baseline of for someone to, to evangelize? Well, yes and no. I mean, there's a sense at which, to the no answer, you have uh, biblical examples like the man born blind. And what does he say? Well, I don't know much, but what I do know is that I was once blind and now I see. So there's, there is the, the simplistic nature of just testifying to God's transforming work in your life. And by virtue of the fact that you have a student ministry and a church to invite someone to, we can send students out to, to testify. God's done something in my life. You should come and see and hear. Then the youth pastor, parent, whomever can take that conversation further and explain 
the more robust totality of the gospel. But if we are if we're actually saying students are to be evangelists, they're to go and share, then one of the essential works for us as leaders is to ensure that we help them be able to articulate what makes the gospel the gospel. One of the places that we see this um, most commonly is in First Corinthians 15. It's one of uh, Paul's most famous passages. This is the passage where he talks about sin being defeated, uh, death, where is your sting, really uh, points forward to the hope of the resurrection. Early in that chapter, I believe it's verses 1 through 4, Paul speaks about the gospel being of first importance and reminds them, this is what I testified to you when I spoke of Christ. And he outlines five things. Jesus as the God-appointed Messiah, the son of David, the promised one from long ago, that Jesus uh, died, that he was crucified, uh, the nature of the atoning sacrifice, which I think points out also man's sinfulness. We needed someone to die because our sin brought about death. Um, burial of Christ. And this is the third aspect Paul speaks of in 1 Corinthians 15, which is interesting. We don't often think of testifying to the gospel as speaking about the burial of Jesus, but I'm convinced that this is a, a testimony to the fact that Jesus really was dead. This wasn't a, a, a fake. This wasn't a phony, but Jesus really died. He, he bore the wrath of God on our behalf. Then he was raised uh, on the third day. So the victorious resurrection uh, demonstrating that he was the perfect son of God who could defeat Satan, sin, and death. And then his appearances, the fifth aspect. He says he, he really appeared to all these hosts of people uh, following his resurrection. So at its core, we've got to say that to, to evangelize, to speak of the gospel, is to speak of Jesus. So to merely say God loves you or to merely say God's transformed my life, well, that's good, and we certainly want people doing that. But it is, at, at its essence, it is not speaking of the gospel. To speak of the gospel is to speak of his person and work uh, on our behalf. And to speak of Jesus is to be able to articulate why Jesus matters. What did he do? I mean, the famous verse in Second Corinthians 5, he made him who knew no sin to become sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This great exchange, the wrath due our sin credited to Christ, the righteous life that we could not earn because of Jesus' work credited to us. This is a hard concept, quite frankly. It is not as simple as Jesus died so you can go to heaven. Um, there is more there. there. There's more there, even for adults, that is, is challenging, really, to wrap your mind around. Now, I'm not saying that students need to have a PhD in order to speak of the gospel. I'm not saying adults need to, uh, but I am saying that there's a minimum threshold of what it is to evangelize, what it is to speak of the gospel, and either we have to do what I alluded to earlier, we have to say we're going to send students out to compellingly speak of Jesus, his work in their life, and then leverage the communal nature of the overall church where pastors and parents and youth workers and a host of others can really lean in and help round out this gospel presentation. Or, secondly, we've got to make sure that we instill in our students a clear understanding of what the gospel is, why Jesus matters, so that when they're testifying to the gospel, they're speaking of it in its fullness. Now, certainly, I, I would suggest that th these two uh, the movement between these two happens as a student ages. So when you're looking at a 12, 13, or 14-year-old middle school student, you're more than likely going to have to lean into the first alternative. Um, at that point, the student's cognitive development is still at a point where it's going to be very difficult for them to articulate uh, a robust gospel presentation. And so at that point, we would say, man, middle school students, should they be evangelists? Absolutely. Should they share? Yes. Um, but we want to see parents and youth workers and leaders come alongside of them and help them fill in the gaps um, where either they're lacking, they're lacking the words to communicate. But then as we age and as we see students move 16, 17, 18, cognitive development is more robust. They should be able to at that point, if they profess faith in Jesus, have an understanding of why Jesus matters for them. 
and in turn be able to articulate it clearly to others. Certainly as they head off to college, if they're living as a missionary, this is the work they're going to be doing. So we'd want to see them growing in these skills. So uh, all that said to say, uh, you who are working with students, you have a massive opportunity uh, to put words in their mouth, um, as it were, so that they can speak clearly and compellingly of the gospel message. And I think it's important that we continually highlight just how critical that work is. We can't merely say, go be evangelist, go fulfill the Great Commission, go tell people about God, if we're not coming alongside of them and discipling, discipling them into an understanding of who Jesus is and why he matters. So I uh, hope you guys have a great week. We'll look at some week three stuff here shortly, um, but wanted to follow up from some of the blog posts I've read uh, up to this point. Enjoy your Saturday or Sunday or whenever you're watching this video. Enjoy the sunshine and uh, hopefully uh, continued learning through our class.